It's Sunday night, and we're in a subject that people will ask me, why do you preach on this so much? Why do you stay on the subject? You can take any given subject that I'm teaching on, and it will go into every section of the Bible. On Sunday mornings, I've been teaching on predestination. This is Sunday morning's message. And Sunday night, I'm preaching on the doctrine of the devil. And the doctrine of the devil and predestination are related in a certain way. That's because everything blends with everything else. Predestination is about about the people that God foreknew, for whom he did foreknow. Foreknow meaning prognosco means to know intimately ahead of time. God knew us and chose us before the foundation of the world. He's predestined us to conform, to conform to the image of Christ. Icon is the word image. It means likeness. He's predestined to conform to be like Christ. Well, we start off as baby believers. We start off with a little faith. Oh, ye of a little faith. Oligos pistis means puny faith, and we have to grow. We start off with a lot of the doctrine of the devil in us. We want self, don't we? That is the doctrine of the devil. That's the doctrine of daimonion. D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N. That's our word demon. It comes from the root D-A-I-O, meaning to distribute fortunes. And we've talked about the fortunes were in the tree in the garden. The Bible says, uh, it was, John said, all that's in the world, 1 John 2, 16, 17. All that's in the world, this would be the fortunes of the world. All in the world would be the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Well, that's what a man has in the outer man, outer man, that God's got, that God is not, has to overcome. He's going to overcome in all of his elect family. And he's going to put us through fire and trials to get rid of this doctrine of the devil. Well, the Bible says in the latter times, or in the times that we're in, some shall depart from faith. Well, in order to depart from faith, you have to be adhering to faith, don't you? You can't depart from something. You can't leave the house if you've never been at the house. You can't leave your work if you've never been at work. You can't leave somewhere where you're not there. They'll depart from faith. And we have gone through a a series on faith and everything that it is and does. Not everything, but a lot that it is and does. And they'll depart from faith. Well, we know that faith is a daily cross. Faith believes God and ceases to believe self. So we go after a daily cross. If you are into this outer man, you have an outer and an inner man. The outer man serves the law of the flesh. And the inner man serves the law of God, and that's Christ in you, and that's what's been born again. And you have that man in you that can't sin, and you have the man on the outside of you that can't quit sinning. And will not he will die a little at a time. Men depart from faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of daemonion, or distributing fortunes. When a man is a new Christian, born again, He's living in the flesh carnally, and it takes a long time for him to grow up. Well, he's into himself, and the doctrine of the devil is self. Jesus even said, Jesus rebuked the man. He rebuked him, A-U-T-O. He rebuked self. That word auto is our word, A-U-T-O. I keep saying an automobile. The reason they call it automobile is because they quit pulling these carriages with horses and it became self-mobile with that engine. You have an auto 
autobiography. Autobiography is a biography that is written by the subject of the biography. It, it has the authority of the man who lived the life. Well, that's self-biography, self-mobile. Well, Jesus rebuked self, so self, we all have the doctrine of the devil in us when we first come to the knowledge of Christ, and we have to grow up, like we said this morning, and mature, and God's got to get rid of that contention and strife, anger over people taking our doctrine from us because we haven't grown in faith like predestination says we have to, and we're going to be conformed to the likeness of Jesus, and self is going to die with tribulation and trial and fire and persecution over the years. We'll become like Christ, and we're unlike him when we first come to the knowledge of the truth. Other than that inner man, we got little faith. So the doctrine of the devil, can you see the relationship to predestination? This predestination is about light. Of course, it's the word prohorizo. It means to be for, determined for the boundary of light, because that's our word horizon. And light is truth, and that's Christ. And the Holy Spirit is truth. Holy Spirit, so when God overcomes us, he's getting rid of this self-doctrine. The Bible says that with the outer man, the outer man in Romans 7, he serves the flesh. Well, that's what a man is into, and when he departs from faith, he departs from death to self, he departs from self-denial, he departs from... Uh, he departs from a, a daily cross. He departs from all of this. He departs from tribulation and trials and persecution. And he gives heed to things and stuff. And he gets mad and he gets angry. And he has contention and strife and pride in his heart. That's the doctrine of the devil that we have in the flesh. It's the doctrine of self. So these two subjects are related to one another that I preach. I've been meaning to say this for a long time, but Sunday morning and Sunday night are basically the same message. The doctrine of the devil is about darkness. Darkness, a lie, and that's the exact opposite of what predestination is about, about truth, about the likeness of Jesus, about us being conformed to that. But the fact that we have to be conformed means that we're not conforming. We're going after the doctrine of self or the doctrine of demon. And God has to put us through a lot of fire to get us out of the doctrine of the devil into death to self, into the doctrine of Christ. Can we see that? It's really simple. All the subjects that I teach on are related to each other. Now we're talking about, we don't believe in demons here. We've said a lot of the reasons we don't believe in demons. When you study demons, you don't just study a Strong's Concordance. You have to go back into history. All these historians that have studied, they're sociologists, they are men who study the social mores and the culture of the uh, world of different periods of time. And all of these scholars who study history, they're going to tell you that all of this doctrine, demons, they'll tell you that demons were gods in the ancient world, and that these gods were actually reduced to demons from Mount Olympus. Now, it's Mount Olympus. Mount Olympus is in Greece. And Mount Olympus is the home of the gods, the home of Aphrodite, the home of Jupiter, the home of Zeus, the home of... And they're all basically, they have different names. I said Jupiter. Jupiter's in Rome. Zeus is the father of the gods in Greece. Jupiter's the father of the gods in Rome, and they're the same thing under a different title. You have Venus over here in Rome. You have Aphrodite in Greece. That's the same. It's the same thing, a different name. That's all it is. 
And the same goes for when you go into other cultures. This is what they called demons in the ancient world. Let me read something to you here. I have said that two of the best sets of books, I've been reading a lot to you out of the Hastings. There's a section in Hastings on demons and spirits. Excellent section on, excellent study on what demons are. Demons and fairies and and totems. We think of totem as the American Indian thing. Well, it was more than that. In all of the land of the fairies among the Celts, they talked about totems constantly. Totem meant kinfolk. And all of these gods were supposed to be ancestors deified as gods. They would look back at an ancestor and they would say, this great ancestor of ours came out of a flood and he brought this ark out. The ark, by the way, looked like a box. Looked like that. And it had one opening in it, a window up here. And our ancestor came out of the ark one day, opened up this door, came out on Mount Ararat, Ararat, and he walked out here in the world, and eight people came out with him, and the head of that system was Noah, and he was he came out of 370 days in the ark, so they called him a fish god. A few generations later, they'd call him a fish god. Well, when you, when you get into the Hastings and other books, you'll find that Dagon was the fish god of the Philistines. Dagon, because dog is the word fish in the Hebrew. And Dagon was the Philistines' fish god. You remember we talked about when the Ark of the Covenant was taken by the Philistines, they took it over to, to Ashdod and put it in the temple of Dagon. Remember that? I believe that's the fifth chapter of, of uh, or sixth chapter of 1 Samuel. So they took it over in the, into the fish god. If you look up Tammuz, it will tell you it was the fish god of Babylon. These, and all the, the scientists won't give you emphatic statements. They'll say these in all probability were just the deification of Noah. So they would take something out of the past. Israel worshipped anything after Gideon died they took the ephod that Gideon wore put it upon a pole and worshiped it after Moses uh, brought the children of Israel through Egypt out of the wilderness from Egypt and uh, at one point there in numbers God brought serpents into the because of Israel's wickedness he brought serpents fiery serpents into Israel they began to bite people and they began to die God said, raise up a brazen serpent. They did, and whoever looks lives. They took this brazen serpent a generation later, raised it up, and worshipped it. They'd worship everything that had done some good for them. They'd raise up men, and they would call these men daemonion. They deified them, made them a deity. Now, I have got... Here in, when you read these historians, you have to read them with uh, a keen eye. You have to exegete history just like you do the Bible. Leave their mistakes behind because if you study enough of this, you're going to find that these daemonions were gods. This is McClinic and Strong, Psychopedia, Biblical, Theological, and Ecclesiastical Literature. Let me read to you a little bit about daemonion, or D-A-E-M-O-N, which is another way of spelling this, D-A-E-M-O-N. Now, I don't believe everything they say because I believe the guys that wrote these articles didn't have a full view. I don't even believe they studied this as much as I have, but let me show you some of the things they'll say. Daemon, the Greek, D-A-I-M-O-N, And its derivative, daemonion, both render devil in the English version of the New Testament. In the original, however, they are carefully distinguished from the term diabolos. Because diabolos, when you find devil in the New Testament, it'll be either diabolos or it will be daemonion. 
And daemonion is our word demon. Daemonion is imaginary. To cast out devils, diabolos, is to cast out self. Now, a person who was daemonizomai, D-A-I-M-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I, which is a derivative of this word daemonion, means to be insane. Now, men have to deal with these definitions. Let me read some more of this. These two words, daemonion and daemon and daemonion, are used as synonymous both by profane, profane and sacred writers. Profane doesn't mean to curse. Profane means writers or commercial writers out here in the world. The etymologies which the Greek authors themselves assigned to them all point to some supposed characteristic of these so-called intelligent beings to whom the words are applied. For example, Plato. Now, are we going to believe that Plato actually understands the demons of Pentecostalism of the 21st century? No. Plato, in his Catullus, derives the word from daemon, meaning knowing. Well, I don't believe that. Because Satan is not all-knowing, or demons are not all-knowing. If there was such a thing as demon, only God is all-knowing. In allusion to the superior intelligence and consequent efficiency ascribed to demons. Eusebius, which is another church historian, uh, from Demon to be terrified. Others as Proculus from Dio, meaning to distribute. See, you got three different things here. Now, everything I've studied, it means to distribute. Because demons were supposed to assign the lots or destinies of mankind. The subject is greatly encumbered with superstition. By heathen writers, the terms in question are employed with considerable latitude. There's a lot of looseness there. Latitude, there's a lot of place for interpretation. You just kind of got a broad spectrum where you can kind of apply whatever you want to. In Homer, one of the ancient Greek writers, where the gods, the gods, are but supernatural men, Daemon is used interchangeably with theos. How many times have I said that? A hundred? To the pagans, D-A-I-M-O-N, was interchangeable with the word theos. Now, not to the believer, because theos is the word God, and a daemon was a god, but they were the gods of Olympus. I'm trying to verify through all these different sources that all this that's going on in Pentecostal churches and a lot of the Baptists who believe in demons, it's not true. And then he goes on to say, the, what's evil is man's heart. The heart, I keep quoting the verse in Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If the heart is deceitful above all things, and daemon is a thing. Daemon in the New Testament Greek is neuter gender. Neuter means it's a thing. It means it's not male or female. It's not a man or a woman. So daemon is a thing being neuter gender. Well, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Therefore, if there were demons, your heart is more evil than a demon. The problem in the world is men. Well, the problem in the world is men. Is evil men that are not born again. That's the most wicked thing I have ever confronted in my life. In the music business, in real estate, in the ministry. I traveled as a young preacher in the 60s all over America. The most wicked thing I ever ran across was men. Never saw a demon in my life. Because there's no such thing. Then he says, Afterwards in Hesiod, when the ideas of the gods had become more exalted and less familiar, the demones are spoken of as intermediate beings, the messengers of the gods to men. 
they're telling us that they are gods through all these historical accounts. These men, it probably took, this is a 12-volume set. I don't know how many men contributed to it. Probably four or 500 men contributed to this set of books. To get one set of encyclopedias out, they have to have a whole bunch of men. All of those men are not going to agree on everything. So you have to read very perceptively when you're reading, discriminate, look at exegete and weigh things out and find out if it weighs out with everything else. And they go on in here, they identify these demons as gods all through this. All through this, they identify them. Now, let me read something else to you. There's a man named F.E. Peters. He wrote a book called Harvest of Hellenism. Hellenism, Hellas. Hellas is a term for the culturalization. Culture, let me put it this way, Grecian culture, Greek culture. If something is Hellenized, what, what happens to that system it is made a Greek system. They have the Greek philosophies. They have the Greek language. They have Greek culture. They have Greek idioms. Greek metaphors. And the two most popular philosophies was Epicureans. and Stoics. And Paul uses Stoic terminology and Epicurean terminology all the time in his writings. But if you don't know what these things are among these historical writers, these sociologists, a sociologist, I took sociology in college, it is the study of societies in various ages, what they believed. It's been 2,000 years since Jesus confronted the man of the Gadarenes. They had all kinds of sayings and all kinds of terminology. If you look in, in Luke, the seventh chapter, Luke 7, where the woman has seven demons, or seven D-A-I-M-O-N-I-O-N, seven demonions, Mr. Lightfoot said it was their culture and their custom to call their sins and vices by the title of demons or demonion. If a person had a certain sin, they would say he had the demonion of uh, adultery, the demonion of homosexuality, the demonion of thievery. That's what they would call it. Now, this man here, I've been wanting to read something to you out of this. This is out of Harvest of Hellenism. And when you go into the, anytime you're going to study this in any of these encyclopedias, if you've got an index volume, you don't have an index volume on the McClinic and Strong, but you have an index volume on the Hastings, and you go and look up demon or daemon or look up any other word that's, Look up devil. It will take you to the volume and the page number in that. Now, this is a book that I picked up down here at, uh, at uh, Book Attic. And it had so much tremendous stuff in it. I want to read to you. This man is a professor and a doctor of theology. And he goes into what they said the demons were in the first century. But notice how he... Now, I've said this already. Demons started in Genesis 11, verse 4, when they said, Let us build us a city and a tower. This is the beginning of Babel, or Babylon. This is the first dynasty of Babel in Genesis 11 and 4. They said, Let us make us a name. Let us make us a name. That is everything that this demon worship is built upon. Name is the word shim. It means authority. We'll make up our own authority, our own doctrine, and it will, it will parallel 
the doctrines of the Bible. It'll have a Savior in it. It'll have a virgin-born Savior. Why would God let those people do that to keep them confused? It'll have a Savior. It'll have a salvation. It even had a new birth in it. And even when they prayed, they would say, Pray, our dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we have eternal life in eternity. That was the prayers of these to these demons. Let me read to you what Mr. Peter says. This is amazing. He says, Julius Caesar's conversion of the Roman state to the Egyptian solar year, solar means sun, was another milestone along the same route. Sun cult. Cult was worship. The early Christians were called cult of Christians. The sun worshipers were called the sun cult. Sun cult, cult means to cultivate, and solar calendar are closely related as the republic passed to empire. The religion of the sun gained ever wider acceptance among the Romans. The birthday of the invincible sun, Dis Natalis Solus Invicti, which fell shortly after the winter solstice. We know that, don't we? Winter solstice, December the 25th, and uh, December the 21st, and the birth of the sun god. He's not trying to argue about Christmas. He's giving you history. And then December, that was the winter solstice, longest nights of the year. On December the 25th, they gave the birthday of the unconquerable, or the invincible sun. He ties this with demons. Says that the sun gods were demons, and the moon goddesses and the tree goddesses. I'm reading it to you so you won't have any doubts that demons are not out here causing people to do evil, wicked things. The Bible says that when a man is drawn away of his, he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Man's problem is himself. After Nero, he says, it was celebrated with pomp in the empire this winter solstice. After Nero, who styled himself the new Helios, H-E-L-I-O-S, which is the word sun. He, the Caesar said he was the son of the sun god, or the demon. The cult of the sun, in its association with imperial ideas, had a marked vogue. The Severan emperors openly embraced it as their own, and no one knew or remembered or cared that Baal of Helio, Helio Gobulus was originally a sky god, not a sun god. They didn't care. They just went ahead and started calling him a sun god. And that the emperor's name was Elagabalus. Finally, Aurelian constituted the worship of Sol Invictus as the official cult of the Roman Empire. Then he goes on to say, The belief in the divinity of the omnipotent and universal sun was but one aspect of the movement. The other more evolutionary solution was to downgrade the Olympians to the status of Damones. He sang. They took the Olympian gods, the gods of the Pantheon, P-A-N-T-H-E-O-N. Pantheon was the temple in Greece where they had all the gods. Pan means all. That's a Greek word, pos, meaning all. Pan is a form of pos. So they took the pantheon of the gods and reduced them to D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S. And that's the truth. This is cultural history. There's no demons. It's man's imagination. Man's imagination is evil because this they begin to do when they said, let us make us a name. The Bible says nothing will be restrained from them now which they've imagined to do. All this stuff about demons is Venus and, and Hercules and Zoroaster and Tammuz and all the rest of the gods. The Olympian gods, the gods of Mount Olympus, the gods of Greece, the gods of Rome, the gods of Babylon, the gods of Joppa, the gods of, of all the ancient world, those were the demons. If you believe in demons, you have to believe that Venus is flying somewhere around out here, or Hercules is out there. 
and he goes into this whole thing. Viewed in its origin, Damon has a dual nature. In, now, he writes like a real scholarly man, and he is. He's a brilliant man when it comes to history. I'm not saying he understands the Bible, but he's telling you where all of this originates and where it comes from. It comes out of Mount Olympus. In over 2,000 years, what can you do with an imagination if you let it go wild? And it crept into the church. All these people say they got demons in the church. They don't say they got Hercules in the church, do they? Well, that's what they were 2,000 years ago. And he says, in one instance, it seemed to be a projection of one or another of the powers of God. The externalization of one of his attributes in other contexts, it was unmistakably, unmistakably a projection of the vital principle of living things, and particularly of man, where the soul demon is sometimes within and sometimes outside its normal dwelling place, the body. It was the first way of looking at demons, or demones, that eventually led to their important position as minor gods and messengers. If you believe in them, you've got to believe in minor gods. And the word messenger is angeloi. A-N-G-E-L-O-I. O-I is plural. The second, a soul demon, was gradually distinguished from the soul of which was originally projection evolved into the personal demon of, or daemon of Socrates and Plato. And they said that was their personal God that dwelled in them and led them to fortunes and helped guide them in their life. And finally, into guardian angel of the Judeo-Christian tradition, what was once to Plato and to Socrates what to them was a demon became the guardian angels of Christianity, guiding you to good fortune. It crept into the church, and people think it's real. The intermediary position of demones, D-A-I-M-O-N-E-S, frees the high God of any necessity of becoming directly involved in the affairs of men. So what originally the demones were, were they were inferior gods that took care of all the things on earth. This would be Hercules and Venus and Aphrodite and, and Addis and all the rest of those gods. There were thousands of them in the ancient world. And instead of God having to come down here and take care of things, they were guardians that would take care of everything. They were guardian angels. They were guardian beings. It's really ridiculous. It has turned from this intellectual concept of what he's explaining here to somebody jumping up and down in church and wallowing on the floor going, eh, eh, eh. it's kind of lost its uh, intellectual capacity, hasn't it? The sense not only of the nearness of the gods, notice he refers to them all as gods through this whole section. The nearness of the gods, but also of working of their all-pervasive powers in both the animate and inanimate world. Here, too, the demones provided a ground for reconciling those two discordant religious themes. I'll just read a couple other things. For the intellectuals, demon made possible a personalized and religious approach to the speculations of the new physics, and with its investigations into the extraordinary powers and properties resident in nature. Demonism was religious correlate of cosmic sympathy or sympathy towards the cosmos, which is where these gods lived. And the two were, in fact, identified as early as, Zono, as, early as Zonocrates, that's one of the ancient philosophers, the ordinary man caught between malevolent Damanes and the mysterious Dynamis. It had its errors as well. The Homeric hero, they were called heroes, all of these gods were called, Hercules was a hero. He went down in the underworld and conquered the evil gods, the ones that were keeping the crops down for the winter. Might walk in, this, you say, Jim, that just sounds like so much mush. It is. It's, what, it's, what, it's where it came from. It came out of Olympus, crept through society and entered into the churches. 
And people have got this wild imagination. And if you read something with this much proper study and intellectual capacity to it, people are not going to even believe it. He's telling you where it originated. It came out of Olympus. The new style religion, tumbling forth from its newly enlarged domain, came a profusion of... Listen, listen, let me read this again. The new style religion, which would be the demon religion, in league with science, mixing it with science, had no lack of remedies. Tumbling forth from its newly enlarged domain came a profusion, profusion of holy men, quacks, miracle workers, priests, astrologers, magicians, Eastern savants, suffering saints, theatrical cynics, stoic vegetarians, devised emperors, and rich, and a rich clutch of charms, tables, recipes. Recipes. You remember in Macbeth that they go to the witches and they concoct a recipe to conjure up cures, uh, frogs, a frog's uh, hair and a and a tongue of a snake, and they put it all in a boiling cauldron, boil, boil, tubble, and draw. You remember that? In prayers to whatever God, he said, this all came along with the demon culture, planet Damon, or hero, the patient might inquire. Hellenism had traveled an enormous distance from the tranquil slopes of Mount Olympus. That's where demons come from. And it's alive and well in Pentecostal churches and some ignorant Baptists believe there's demons out there. What's evil is man's hearts. Let me show you this. It's, it is Christmas. It's all the same thing, Christmas. I said demons were born on December the 25th. It all started back here. All the gods started in Genesis 11. Babylon mothered it all. So if demons were the gods, it, they were nothing but Nimrod, the original prototype, and his queen of heaven, Semiramis, or whatever you want to call her. It all goes back to that. The women were the tree goddesses, identified with the moon, the queen of heaven. The moon is the queen of heaven. The king of heaven is the sun. That's in the first chapter of Genesis. The sun ruled the day, the moon ruled the night, but men loved darkness rather than night because their deeds are evil. And the demons of the Jews had to be back to their abode by dawn. And the vampires had to be back to their abode by dawn. And they were demons. And the fairies had to be back by dawn. They partied in the moonlight. And the moon was moonstruck. The boy was brought to Jesus in Matthew, the 17th chapter. He said, my son is lunatic. Do you think that man knew what he was talking about when he said he is lunar tick or moonstruck? When that man said, my, money, my son is moonstruck, struck, do you believe Jesus believed his son was moonstruck? He said it. Jesus didn't say it. People can't get it through their head. Who's doing the talking? That's funny to me. It's, it's all imagination. They identify the gods. He's talking about the demones. Gosh, all through here. They're demigods. D-E-M-I-G-O-D-S. That's inferior gods. It was said. I've got a book on the demigods of the ancient world. A demigod was an inferior god. Demigod. And they said the creator of all things was Sophia or Sophos. Sophos is the Greek word wisdom. Wisdom, and we get the name Sophia from that. And Sophia was the goddess, one of the goddesses of the ancient world of wisdom. She was a demon or a demigod. It's a shame that people love to embrace all this ignorance. Let me read this right here. Plutarch, which was one of the ancient philosophers, historians, was a theological optimist, and his god a benevolent one. They believed that these demons would either be good or evil, good gods or evil gods. They would either get you a job or break your leg, make you get fired. In the first century, 
demon didn't have the same meaning as it has today in the churches. It means something evil today. They had good demons and evil demons. Even Augustus Caesar was called a good demon. That's why when the rich young ruler came to Jesus in Mark 10, said, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? That was treason in the Roman Empire to call someone good besides Caesar. Because Augustus Caesar was the good God or the good demon. And he says, Plutarch was credulous in the manner of the times, but attempted within the limits of his belief to combat the excessive fear of the divine. And then he puts in parentheses, D.C. Dominia. Yeah. And that's the same word Paul used for those guys at Mars Hill when he said, I perceive in all things you're too superstitious. Too superstitious comes from Delia, D-E-I-L-I-A, and Daemonion. It means a fear of the gods. And the reason Paul said they had a fear of the gods is because they made an altar to all the gods they could think of, and they had hundreds of them, and they said, we might have missed one. Let's make an altar to the unknown God. Paul said, I perceive that you have a fear of the gods. This is what a lot of people that call themselves Christians do. Well, Jim Brown may be right. I'll believe him, but I'll believe Billy Graham. I'll keep him in reserve, and I'll keep Charles Stanley in reserve, and maybe I need to keep Kenneth Copeland in reserve, because in case one of those are right, I'll believe all of them. You can't believe all of them. I'm in exact opposition to Kenneth Copeland. I'm on the other side of the universe from Billy Graham. You can't have a fear of the gods and embrace all of them. That's superstition. He said that was, D.C. Dominia was the essence of superstition, being afraid of the gods. The same repugnance for D.C. Dominia, Dominia had driven Epicurus to a species of atheism. But for Plutarch, there was a middle path between the two, a way illuminated by reason. Plutarch would accept all the gods, I guess. He said even the demons, and he identifies Pan with the gods, with the demons, demones. He says that Pan, when we think of Pan, we think of a camera panning the audience or covering all the congregation. If you pan a situation, you look at all of it. Pan means all. And Pan was said to be all in all. I think that's what God said he was. I am all in all. He was saying, your demon Pan is not all in all. He was said to be the God of the roads, the God of the highways, the God of the hodos. He said, it was said that Pan was you hodos. The well way. That's the word prosper. In 3 John 2, you hodos, the well way. Jesus said, I am the hodos, not pan. And he's in Plutarch even said that even demons had to die. Well, if you watch some movie of Hercules or one of those gods and he's up in the sky somewhere and they're fighting each other and they, it's possible for them to get killed. That's crazy to me. Standing close to the identification of Theoi, which is more than one God, Theos would be singular, and Dynamis was the downgrading of Olympians to the role of Damones. He said the Olympian gods were downgraded and they were had their position taken away. It's kind of like some sergeant losing his stripes. Well, we're going to degrade you and put you down to the grade of demons, and you'll be a guardian demon, and you walk around behind somebody and make sure they have the fortunes that they want. Gosh, there's so much in here on this, and all I did was make a copy of some of it. It speaks of the private gods. Demons are nothing but gods of the ancient world, and you know what? It just shows how corrupted America is 
we have just pulled all this stuff into our churches and pretending. Let me give you something I've written on this. Look over here. We've said over here in Jeremiah 17 and 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. A demon is neuter gender. It's a thing. So if there is such a thing as a demon, as I've said before, your heart is more wicked than that. The demon that's around is a sissy upside your heart. Now, look over here in Ecclesiastes 8. Look at Ecclesiastes. Th God doesn't say your problem is a demon. He says it's your heart. Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter. These are why we don't believe. Do you know how hard it is to study all these writers on demons and all that they have to say? You have to educate yourself to the ancient world and what they said. Look here in Ecclesiastes. That is a great book if you can find Harvest of Hellenism. It's an old book. I picked it up for a few dollars on sale. Of course, most people don't want the books that I want, so they, the books that I want end up on sale at some bookstore, and I get them cheap. Because most people are not interested in Harvest of Hellenism. I've got a book. It's called Hellenistic philosophy, and it talks about Epicurean philosophy and Stoic philosophy through the whole book. And those are the two most popular uh, philosophies of the first century, of the Greeks. The Greeks had been around uh, when Jesus was here. The Greek culture had been developing for about 800 years not just for 300 years since Alexander the Great had ruled, he took the languages that had developed in Greece for 500 years, brought them into the world, gave them all the gloss and the dialects in the world. That was around 300, well, 332 B.C. And then by the time Jesus is here and the apostles, the Greek philosophy's been around for for 800 years. Well, why is the world practicing Greek philosophy and not Roman philosophy and Roman culture? Because the Romans were barbaric. They were slaughtering the world. They were trying to kill everybody and conquer. They had very little philosophy. No languages. So they kept all of Alexander the Great's contributions to the world of languages and philosophers and ideas and they were still worshiping these demon gods that had come out of Greece. Mount Olympus crept into the New Testament. Well, how in the world is... I thought those Jews there in Israel believed they had demons. They did, but they lived in a Greek culture world. It had been around a long time. And people, as soon as you're born in Israel, you get to be five or six years old, and your mother said, uh, Miss... Elijah's wife over there is casting a spell on me and we're going to have to go over here to, to Jeremiah's mother and see if she can't remove this spell and I'm afraid of her and she's going to get me. She says that I'm going to die. She's going to stick pens in this doll and this is real common. Not exactly that way, but not like voodoo. It was voodoo because voodoo is the same thing as Christmas. Uh, but they were constantly afraid and they were running around and having all of this incantations in their homes and they were believing in demons when jesus called the apostles they come out of that kind of a world and they believed in demons because when he's walking on the water they say it's a phantasm it's a spirit they use the word phantasm which was a demon in that we get our word fantasy from that jesus said no it's not a phantasm it's me Amazing to me, the apostles are, were just, let me put it plain, they were dumb kids. They didn't know nothing. Jesus would say, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees when you go over across the Sea of Galilee. They'd go, duh. Uh, because we didn't bring any bread. He said, I'm not talking about bread, I'm talking about doctrine. <laughs> they didn't get it when they first started. They had to grow old to get it. Now, look here in Ecclesiastes, the 8th chapter. Notice something that God does not say. 8th chapter, verse 10. 
And so I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This is also vanity, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. You're always wanting God to get your enemy real quick. He said, my sentence against an evil work doesn't happen when you want it to happen. Therefore, the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. He didn't say they have a demon in them. He said their hearts are set to do evil because the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Look here in chapter 9. Look at verse 2. All things come alike to all. There is one event to the righteous and to the wicked, to the good and the clean, to the unclean, to him that sacrificeth, and to him that sacrificeth not, to the man that's committed to God, the man that's not committed to God. One thing happens to them all. As is the good, so is the sinner, and he that sweareth is he that feareth an oath. This is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all, yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil. He, he doesn't mention demons here, does he? And madness is in their heart while they live. After that, the one thing that happens to all, they go to the dead. You die. That's the one event that happens to them all. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. A dead lion can't do anything. It can't kill anybody. It has no power. That's what he's saying. And all this whole chapter here in the previous chapter is about whatever you do, do it now while you're alive because you don't have any promise to tomorrow. You may be dead. When you're dead, you can't do anything up on the earth. And look over here in... Look at Matthew 23. Go to Matthew 23. Notice God says the problem with man is his heart. He doesn't say it's a demon. 23. 25. Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you may clean the outside of the cup and the platter. You look good on the outside. You got on your nice, bright, pretty robes, and you look all clean, but within you're full of extortionate excess. He's not saying you're full of a demon. It's not what enters a man that defiles a man. It's what comes out of his heart. And look over here in Mark 7. Mark 7. Notice he doesn't mention demons are your problem. He says it's your heart. Mark 7. And verse 25. Uh, verse 21. And Jesus said, That which cometh out of a man is that which defileth a man. It's not what enters into him. He says that in verse 15, there's nothing from without a man that entering into him that can defile him. There's no such thing as a demon entering into a man to defile him. It's what comes out of his heart. The problem with man is himself. That's why when we're born again, God says, I want to get rid of self, that outer man, and it may take me 25 or 30 years, but you're going to leave. And I'm going to be the one that's left, and you're going to worship me. Nobody's been more involved in themselves when I was young than I have. I was so caught up with being somebody and being rich and being famous and, hey, listen to me, see what I can do? I was disgusting, what I was. Look over here in, in Hebrews 3. If you notice, it's the heart that's evil. It's not a demon. The reason all those people said they had demons is because it was the culture of the day. That's what they would say. It was even got to the point that even when they didn't mean it, they used the word demon. Well, I got this demon. I'm sick. They meant I have a problem with my sin or I've got a problem with sickness and 
It must be one of the gods that's making me sick. Venus has come down and given me a virus. If they knew what a virus was. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. Unbelief is an evil heart. Heart. When you don't believe God, and you don't believe what He says, you don't believe you have to take your cross and die daily, you don't believe that Christmas is Christ's Mass, it's pagan, if you don't believe in predestination, you have an evil heart. That's what, notice He doesn't say you have an evil demon of unbelief. You have an evil heart because the heart is deceitful and desperately. If you look at Second Peter 2, look at this. Second Peter, the second chapter. Second chapter. Two verse fourteen. Well, let's read a little bit of this. Let's go back here and notice the evil that's in these men. Go back to verse ten. But chiefly them that walk after the flesh. That's that they walk after the outer man if they're believers. But this is not talking about believers. This is talking about unbelievers. The men that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness means contamination, the osmos. They despise governments. Kuriotes. K-U-R-I-O-T-E-S. They despise K-U-R-I-O-T-E-S. Of course, it's the derivative of kurios, K-U-R-I-O-S, is the word Lord. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I despise when somebody tells me what I have to do. Well, God's going to tell you whether you like it or not. They despise governments. Presumptuous are they. They're just bold. Tolmetes, T-O-L-M-E-T-E-S, T-O-L-M-E-T-E-S. Tolmetes, the word means daring. They just dare to do whatever they want to do. They're daring. Presumptuous are they. Self-willed. Authodes, A-U-T-H-A-D-E-S. Self, auto, had a, a hedonistic person is one who will just live any way they want to live. That's hedonistic. And orthodox is a construction of auto, which is self. They just self-will to do whatever they want. I'll sleep around if I want. I'll cuss if I want. I'll drink if I want. And I'll call myself a Christian if I want. All the days. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Those who are the glory of God or those who are in God's position here upon the earth representing him. Whereas angels which are great in power and might bring not railing accusation of them before the Lord, but these as natural brute beasts Made to be taken and destroyed. Made ganeo means born. They're born to be destroyed. Speak evil of things that they understand not. And shall utterly perish in their own corruption. They live for evil. And shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. As they count it pleasure to riot. In the daytime spots they are on the love feast and blemishes sporting themselves while with their own deceivings while they feast with you they have eyes full of adultery they cannot cease from sin notice they don't have a demon beguiling unstable souls and heart they have exercised with covetous practices their cursed children doesn't say they got a demon they just got wickedness to the core of their hearts. 
That's all that's wrong with man is himself. Now, I'm going to get back to the subject. How much time do I have, Mike? I'm going to get back to the subject that I've been talking about, about people have identified, even some of these writers will say, some people identify demons as fallen angels. We've said they're not fallen angels. They are self. If you imagine something, and all these Greek and Roman gods, that's man's imagination. Imagination is a man allowing himself to think anything he wants to think, and that is just self raising himself up to conjure up anything he wants to conjure. That's what it is. And all that's all demons are. If man can get his eyes off of himself and blame something besides himself for his sin, he can let himself off the hook. In these Pentecostal churches, when they come up and they say demons, oh, this guy's got a demon in him, if we can cast it out, then he can get back up on his feet and get off the floor and quit that spitting stuff all over the place. And we can cast the demon out and he can go on his way and live the way he wants to live. Then that's an excuse for self-repenting. That's what it is. I want us to go back over here. We've been discussing people talking about They've come up with all these different ideas for demons. In the first century, Jesus was bad. That was one of the big battles he had, trying to tell people there's no such thing as demons. It's you. He would heal people. He would cast out devils. But cast out devils was the casting out of self. That's when he wrote upon fleshy tables of our heart. If I with the finger of God cast out devils, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. He wrote upon tables of stone in the Old Testament with his finger, and now he writes upon fleshy tables of our heart. That is when self goes out, and that's when he begins to build up Christ in us. Now, I want us to look over here back to Genesis 6. The biggest fairy tale that has been spun about demons is fallen angels. We've gone through this sixth chapter. We're going through most of it. And the Bible says, let's read a little of it, sixth chapter. Let me give me a drink of water. This is really difficult for men to understand if they don't see the truth in it. If all Scripture is given by inspiration from God, and is profitable to the life of the believer, then we have to get something profitable out of this sixth chapter of, of Genesis. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. If you'll notice, this is the flood chapter beginning. The flood begins here in this chapter. Actually, Noah builds the ark in this chapter. The flood begins in chapter 7, and the previous chapter, chapter 6, was the chapter of the sons of God, which started with God, went to Adam, down to Seth, down to uh, Enosh, down to Canaan, Mahalaleel, on down to Enoch, to, uh, to Jared, to Enoch, to Lamech, to Methuselah, to Lamech, to Noah, to his son Shem. That's chapter 5. Chapter 6, God is saying, through all of these righteous men of chapter 5 and the unrighteous descendants of Cain in chapter 4, they get together. The sons of God, which are the men of chapter 5, look up on the daughters of men of chapter 4. The daughters of men are the sisters of the sons of men. Sons of men were sons of Cain. Sons of God come through the fifth chapter through Seth, who is the substitute for Abel. So this is Abel's chapter in chapter 5. Then he says here in chapter 6, Became to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, 
that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit will not always strive with man, with the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were men of old, men of renown. And then God saw the wickedness of man that was great in the earth. Now out of the clear blue sky, God sees the wickedness in the earth. The wickedness was the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. Sons of God are believers. To be a son of someone, I have said over and over, you have to be doing the will of that father. You cannot call fallen angels sons of God because they're not doing the will of God. Jesus told the Pharisees, your father is the devil, your sons of Satan. It doesn't matter that you're of the seed of Abraham. You're literally out of his sperm uh, and descendants of his seed, but you're not sons of Abraham. We're children of Abraham by faith. We're sons of God. We're sons of God. The Bible says, and we are sons of God. So if we're sons of God, it's because we're doing the will of the Father. Jesus said, my brothers and sisters, are sons of God are those who do the will of the Father. You cannot call sons of God fallen angels because they're fallen mainly for because of the word fallen. Fallen angels are already locked in Tartarus. I was reading out of the Hellenism, the book of uh, F.E. Peters, that harvest of Hellenism, he said Elysian, I don't know how you spell it, Elysian, the Elysian fields, and among the, among the people of superstition, they believed that, they believed that the believers of their gods went to the Elysian fields. He says that Elysian fields were in opposition to Tartarus among the pagans. So whenever the Bible says there in 2 Peter, the second chapter, second chapter, that these fallen angels are reserved in Tartarus till the day of judgment. That were reserved is the word tereo. It means they remain unchanged. They are guarded against any, any escape from Tartarus, so they're already in Tartarus, which is the lowest pits of Hades, Hades, and that's exact opposite to the Elysian fields, which is the what we would call heaven. And you see, I believe it's supposedly that in in mythology that Arthur, King Arthur, goes to the Elysian fields and many of those Pagans, that was pagan terminology. Now, he says here there were giants in the earth in those days. I keep saying giant doesn't mean tall men in this text. Giant is the way they translated it, and it's not a good translation. When you define it, it's the word Nephilim. And it means bullies or tyrants. What has happened, sons of God are believers, sons of God, believers of Genesis 5. Sons of God, some of these descendants, maybe not particularly those exact men, but some of these men, some of those people, they have been Enoch's, Enoch's, these are not the only men alive that's in chapter 5. Enoch had brothers and sisters. Look, look here. I want you to see something here. Look up here in Genesis 5. Look at verse 3. Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were 800 years. And Adam begat sons and 
daughters. That means Adam lived. Well, look here. In the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Well, he begat sons and daughters. Adam had sons and many sons and daughters. The only ones the Bible mentions is Cain, Abel, and Seth. But he had many sons and daughters. People say, well, who did Cain marry? He married his sister. Who else? I mean, there were no other races here. Married his sister. Now, let's get on to something important, all right? Didn't the Lord tell Israel, marry your sisters, marry within the tribes of Israel. Don't marry these pagans out here. Do not give your sons to their daughters, nor take their daughters for your sons. Isn't that what he said? Marry inside the family. They married their sisters. So, in all through here, he'll say Seth lived in the hundred and five years and begat Enosh, and Seth lived after he begat Enosh eight hundred and seven years, and Seth begat sons and daughters. You notice that? That meant every one of these guys had all kinds of sons and daughters. By the time you get through that, and they lived 900 years, 930, 969 years Methuselah lived, he had a lot of kids. Their wives were just beginning to have babies at 200 years old. They begat lots of sons and daughters. So some of those sons and some of those daughters intermarried. All these descendants of the fifth chapter are supposed to be righteous people. They're the ones that get the covenant all the way down. Through that fifth chapter, you get to Noah and then Shem. And Shem receives the blessing of God. So this is the blessed lineage. These are sons of God. And the sons of God married the daughters of men. The daughters of men are Cain's descendants out of chapter 4. You had all kinds of sons and daughters. Only God knows how many kids you had because you had them all in there marrying. You see that? Do you think that these, whenever I would read this, I don't know why I hadn't pointed out to you before, but they begat sons and daughters. Enos begat sons and daughters. And then he died. And Enos and Canaan begat sons and daughters. And Mahalalel begat sons and daughters. And Jared begat sons and daughters. And when you go back to chapter 4, Cain went out of the presence of the Lord in verse 16. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived him by Enoch. And Enoch begat sons and daughters. This is not the Enoch of chapter 5. This is, a, this is one of the sons of men. And Enoch was born, unto Enoch was born Arad, and Arad begat sons and daughters. And Arad begat Mahujael, and he begat sons and daughters. And Mahujael begat Methuselah, and he begat sons and daughters. And Methuselah begat Lamech, and he begat sons and daughters. So you got all these sons and daughters out of these people. So when you get to chapter 6, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, that the daughters were born unto them. And the sons of God looked at the daughters of men, and they married them. What does that say? Look, let me point out something real. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took these daughters of men as wives. Right? Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Sons of God took the daughters of men as wives. Right? Right? Let me just say that again before I read this. Sons of God took the daughters of men as wives. Here in chapter 22 of Matthew, Jesus looks at the Sadducees in verse 29. Jesus answered and said to them, You do err not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, the believers neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. The angels of God don't marry nor are given in marriage, and the fallen angels don't either, unless they manufacture in themselves reproductive organs. Well, who in the world said that angels had reproductive organs? 
What for? To have children? You mean they got you mean they got men angels and women angels? Huh? Angel, angelos. In the Greek is masculine gender. Now how in the world are they marrying? And why would they have reproductive organs so they can have children? They know women angels. What are they going to do? To me, that's ridiculous. Whoever came up with the idea that God gave angels reproductive organs so they could have sex and marry and have children. That had to create the reproductive organs themselves. And nobody has the ability to create but God. It's ridiculous to say that these are fallen angels. It's ridiculous. It's stupid. And you know how many people believe that? All kinds of professors in all kinds of seminaries across America. Some intelligent guys. John MacArthur, I've got a message that he preached on that when he's about 30 years old, years ago, and he preached the sons of God were fallen angels that married the daughters of men. And they say they did that so they could pollute the bloodline of Christ. You know what will pollute the bloodline of Christ? We're the bloodline of Christ. What will pollute it is bringing in false doctrine into our lives and our hearts. What he's telling us here in the sixth chapter, do not marry truth to a lie. Now he's saying, he's not just saying don't marry a person as a husband or wife. He's saying don't marry your life to people that don't believe God. Don't run with them. We've talked about this and we've covered a lot of this. Look over here. The lesson he's teaching us in this sixth chapter of Genesis is don't marry truth to a lie because it angered God so much that he brought the flood upon the earth and destroyed all mankind except for eight people. And he says, at the end of time, at the end of time, they're going to do, be doing the same thing they were in the days of Noah. So whatever was going on in the sixth chapter is going to be going on in the world today. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. They'll be eating, drinking, partying, marrying, and giving in marriage. To give in marriage means to marry two things that do not belong together. He said, give not your sons to their daughters, nor take their daughters for your sons. He tells Abraham in the 20, huh? And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, verse 5, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He didn't say he had a demon. He said his heart was evil continually. And God says, I'm going to destroy the earth. And he tells in verse 14, he tells Noah, build an ark. What he's saying is before I come back at the end of time, it's going to be happening like Noah and I'm going to destroy the world because men are marrying truth to a lie. It's going on in all the churches in America. They've married Christmas into the church, Christ's mass. They, which is accept Christ, walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist. The Catholics raise the Eucharist up and they say, Hocus corpus and fili, and supposedly it turns into the literal body and blood of Christ and they ask people to walk down the aisle and they come down, they used to kneel down, stick their tongue out and they'd place the Eucharist on their tongue. Now some of them take it in their hand. But they were walking down the aisle to accept Christ. And except Christ came into the church out of the Methodists. Methodists came out of the Church of England. The Church of England came out of Roman Catholicism, walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist. The Methodists brought it to America in the early 1800s. That is marrying truth to a lie, accept Christ, accept the Eucharist. Praying a sinner's prayer is a lie. A sinner's prayer for salvation is not true. Every Baptist I know of believes in it. You pray this prayer, uh, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You can't pray to a God you don't believe in. Can you? 
The verse everyone goes to is Romans 10, 13. It's quoted by every Baptist preacher in America. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's true, but that's not the method of salvation because when you read the next verse, the next verse says, how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? Belief is the method of salvation. They have taken the word of God forwardly, twisted it, and said praying is the method of salvation. It is not. Prayer means to bow to the will of God. How can you bow to the will of God when you don't even seek God? There's none that seeketh after God. You can't bring yourself into the kingdom. He has to birth. By a new birth, he has to birth his family that he's preordained before the foundation of the world. Doesn't he? We are living in a world full of corruption. Billy Graham is corrupt. He preaches, accept Christ and pray this prayer. You can't accept Christ. The Bible says you can't accept him. He has to accept us. He scourges every son he receives. The word receive is the word dekomai. It means to accept. He scourges there in Hebrews 12. The natural man does not receive dekomai spiritual things first corinthians 2 14 the natural the physical man the man of the senses does not accept anything spiritual comes from deck which is the word 10 in the greek a decade is 10 years decomai means to reach out the 10 fingers and accept an offer that's been made that is marrying truth to a lie you preachers out there are lying right straight through your teeth when you tell people to accept Christ and pray a prayer and let Jesus come into their heart. Dead men can't let God do anything. That's truth marrying a lie. And do you know that is the great corruption of the world today is accept Christ. The Catholics accept Christ. The Baptists accept Christ. The Church of Christ accept Christ. The Pentecostals accept Christ. Accept Christ has not been going on in the church but for about a hundred and close to 200 years. Before the 1800s, it wasn't in America, Accept Christ. They didn't teach that. That is when the Methodists came to America, came out of the Church of England and brought Accept Christ to America. It's not true. That is marrying. Accept Christ. Sure does sound nice, doesn't it? Got people write me and say, then am I not supposed to accept Christ? You can't accept anything he offers until he gives you a willing heart and bursts you by his will, and then you're willing to accept him as he causes you to be obedient to his word over the years. It seems like everything in the church, they've married, they've married ritual to truth. Just go and listen to some preacher bore you out of your mind with a boring message as he talks about Jesus, God, saved salvation, and it's all wrong. Just listen to him, and that's marrying truth to a lie. You're not ever supposed to marry truth to a lie. I don't run around with people who don't believe God. Don't run around with my own family. My brothers didn't believe truth. My mother didn't believe truth. My father didn't believe it. They think they did because they say they accepted Christ. But you can't accept Christ. You have to be a preordained for eternal life. God's got to cross your path with the gospel. He's got to cut into your heart and cause you to believe and write truth on your heart. And you don't even know how it happened. Oh, you may walk the aisle. I'm not saying everybody that walked the aisle and claimed to have accepted Christ is an unbeliever. I'm saying that had nothing to do with your salvation. Nothing. I hate accept Christ. I hate that doctrine with a passion. I hate that as bad as I hate Christmas. Well, Christmas is I accept Christ, though, isn't it? It's the Mass. My father used to stand and say, if you don't know tonight, this may be your last chance. And I was such a dumb little old kid at 10, 11, 12, 13. I'd walk the aisle over and over and over trying to accept Christ, trying to figure out how to do it. And I'm not kidding. You've heard me say it before. Daddy had to really get sick of seeing me come. 
every time I'd take off, he'd beg people down the aisle, one more verse of just as I am, just as I am. And I'd take off again. And I was so frustrated, I didn't know how to accept Christ. I was seeking God. I was already a believer. He confused me. God had written His Word in my heart as a little boy. I really wanted Jesus when I was seven and eight years old. I loved Jesus. I didn't run around with the kids on the playground that cussed. I didn't. I just wouldn't do things other kids. I would stand off from them and look at them, and I would pray and say, Jesus, I want to come be with you one day. And then my dad starts preaching in 1949 and starts begging people down the aisle. And I was so impressionable. If he said, if you don't know tonight, I, that's my daddy, and he's the preacher, and he knows, and I don't, so I better walk down there again and make sure. He got to where he was frustrated. Just say, Jimmy, sit over there. He quit dipping me in water. He used to dip me in water every time I got saved. There's no such thing as get saved. That's mixing truth with a lie. You can't get saved. Nobody has got saved. If you got saved, then you did it. But you can't get saved. Saved is something he does to his people. They, they talk about get saved as a one-night thing. Saved is the word sozo. It means to be taken from point A all the way to point B, to be preserved through all the dangers and the trials and the fire. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. We have been saved. We are being saved. And we shall be saved. It's not get saved. Get saved is confusing to a baby believer, isn't it? It's not, besides that, it's not something you do. We're not supposed to be mixing these lies you say, Jim, you harp on this stuff. This is what the world believes. I told Willie one day, I believe accept Christ is the most wicked doctrine that's in the world today. Because nobody accepts Christ. None seeks after God. There's none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. Nobody stirs himself up and calls upon God. That word stirreth up, ur, means wake oneself from the dead. You do not wake yourself up from the dead to call on God. Jeremiah 60, Isaiah 64, 7. Nobody calls on God on his own. If God don't put it in your heart to call out, Lord, save me or I perish, you're already a believer if you ever say that. And if you mean it with your heart, and you're not going to say if you don't mean it with your heart. I hate it when these preachers get somebody down at the altar. Baptist churches do this all the time. Just pray this prayer and repeat after me and mean it with your heart. I always want to say, preacher, could I pray this prayer and not mean it with my heart? <laughs> Good grief. I don't like any of the doctrines that I was raised with. People say, well, your dad taught you all this. My dad didn't teach me any of this. He was believed in free will. He believed in accept Christ. My father, before he died, was on the phone with me one time. He said, Jimmy, all that matters is a man accepts Christ as a personal Savior. Well, if that's all that matters, let's have a bunch of Bibles printed up with a bunch of blank white pages and a marker in the middle of it. You open it up and it says, accept Christ as your personal Savior. It's ridiculous. That's marrying truth to a lie. And that, you know, this is called, this is called, accept Christ and, and sinner's prayer, that's called biblical evangelical doctrines of the conservative church in America. Did you know that? That's why I say conservative biblical theology in America is the worst doctrine that's out there in the world. It's worse than being a liberal down here. Somebody called me the other day and said, you know that the Episcopals uh, and the Lutheran Church in New York has got women preachers. Uh, they've, they've got uh, homosexual preachers in the pulpit. I said, well, I don't care about that. That's not a church, and those are not preachers. I don't care how many homosexuals the Episcopals put in the pulpit. 
because that's not a church. And those aren't preachers. And they don't tell the truth. Episcopalians, Episcopal comes from the word episcopal. Episcope, overseer. That's a bishop in the scripture. That's an elder. That's an overseer. They're not overseeing anything. I don't care if they've got lesbians in, in homosexuals in Episcopal churches because they're not preaching David Cross death self self denial. That's a country club. Methodist church is just a country club. It's just we'll have a tea party and we'll play canasta on Thursday nights and we'll have line dancing on Saturday night and we'll teach people to go down here to the Starlight Club and dance in a bar on the following week and they can learn to kick up their heels. I don't care what they do at these country club churches. The thing I hate most of all in America is men who call themselves evangelical Bible-believing Christians like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson and Billy Graham and they're talking about walking the aisle and accepting Christ. That is a lie. But see, you have to believe in predestination to believe the truth, don't you? You have to believe that God births people by his will, of his own will begat his. We're born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh. It's not walking down an aisle. It's not accepting Christ. We're born not of the will of the flesh nor the will of man, but of God. God arranges our life to cross the truth. He cuts into our heart and makes us believe him. Now, that's the truth. But you have to believe that in order to disbelieve, accept Christ. They're in opposition. Predestination, accept Christ, or opposition to each other. Accept Christ is a work that you do, isn't it? If you have to accept and let God come into your heart, you're going to let the living God do what he's going to do anyway? You don't let God do anything. Let Jesus come into your heart. I am sick of let Jesus come into your heart. I have gone, I have preached all over this country in hundreds of churches. I never met any preacher that knew anything about the Bible. I'm tired of Billy Graham. What gets me, he's, Billy Graham has drawn 50, 75, 100,000 people in crusades since the early 50s. He's been one of the most popular men in the world. The Bible says there's a cry of damnation against men that all men speak well of. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. The Bible says that Billy Graham is a false teacher. You tell somebody that, and they will go berserk on you. Billy Graham, you tell them T.D. Jakes is a false teacher. T.D. Jakes has got more catchphrases than anybody I've ever seen. And that's all he's got is catchphrases. I'll tell you what, he, there's two of those charismatics that's more dangerous than anybody else. T.D. Jakes and Rod Parsley. Rod Parsley was instrumental in getting T.D. Jakes into that movement. They know more Bible than any of the other guys, and they know enough to be dangerous. They preach the accept Christ gospel, the prosperity gospel. God wants you rich and wealthy and healthy. I believe those guys are going to be greatly deceived about two seconds after they're dead. They're going to wonder where that heat's coming from. I don't believe those people are believers. Somebody asked me last night, they said, just on the phone, they said, do you believe that these people in these churches, that a majority of them are believers? I said, no. To believe God, you have to believe this book about salvation, about new birth, New birth is of God, it's not of a work. You walk the aisle, that's your work. You pray a prayer, that's your work. But you can't call on God till you believe in him, can you? I hope this is helping you some. I will keep bringing out accept Christ because accept Christ is the doctrine of the world in all the churches of the world. Let Jesus come into your heart when you cannot possibly do that when you're dead and you're sin. I, I tried to let Jesus come into my heart. I tried to accept Christ. I prayed the sinner's prayer out 500 times as a little kid because I was told to do that 
You know what that is? That is abuse. That's abusing baby sheep. And I, I need to say this in the camera. I hate that doctrine. Confuses. I've run out of time. I meant to get on to this. Uh, I hope this helps you some. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, I pray that you'll open up the hearts of these people here. Mature them in the faith. Cause us to continue this work. Open up doors for the ministry. And Lord, I will stand and tell these truths to the world if they kill me for it. Lord, I am so tired of this flesh. God, I pray you'll strengthen some of those in the church to stand up here with me. Because, Lord, the world won't take this for long. We pray that you'll lead us to your elect. Open up many doors for the ministry, and we'll give you praise. In Christ's name, amen. Hey. That's a little known fact, speaking of Mount Olympus. You're on TV in Mount Olympus, Washington. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you are. Oh, that's good. Mount Olympus, Washington. We're getting a hold of this thing on Dean. Stevens. More than one Steve. Steven.